Welcome Faye and Miles and friends to another episode of Reading with Grams. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. Today we are continuing on with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Chapter 3, The Letters from Noah. The escape of the Brazilian boa constructor earned Harry his longest ever punishment. By the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started and Dudley had already broken in broken his new Senna camera, crashed his remote control airplane, and first time on his racing bike, knocked down old Mrs. Fig as she crossed private drive on her crutches. Harry was glad school was over, but there was no escaping Dudley's gang who visited the house every single day. Piers, Dennis, Malcolm, and Gordon were all big and stupid, but as Dudley was the biggest and the stupidest of the lot, he was the leader. The rest of them were all quite happy to join Dudley's favorite sport, Harry hunting. This is why Harry spent as much time as possible out of the house, wandering around and thinking about the end of the holidays where he could just see a tiny ray of hope. When September came, he would be going off to secondary school. For the first time in his life, he wouldn't be with Dudley. Dudley had a place at Uncle Vernon's old school, Smeltings. Piers Polk, Polkis was going there too. Harry, on the other hand, was going to Stonewall High, the local comprehensive. Dudley thought this was very funny. They stuffed people's head down the toilet the first day at Stonewall, he told Harry. Want to come upstairs and practice? No thanks, said Harry. The poor toilets never had anything as horrible as your head down it. It might be sick. Then he ran before Dudley could work out what he said. One day in July, Aunt Petunia took Dudley to London to buy his smelting uniform. Leaving Harry at Mrs. Fig's, Mrs. Fig wasn't as bad as usual. It turned out she broke her leg chirping over one of her cats, and she didn't seem quite fond, as fond as them as before. She let Harry watch television and gave him a bit of chocolate cake that tasted as though she had had it for several years. That evening, Dudley paraded around the living room for the family in his brand new uniform. Smelting's boys wore maroon tailcoats, orange kickboxers, and flat straw hats called boaters. They also carried knobbly sticks used for hitting each other while the teachers weren't looking. This was supposed to be good training for later in life. As he looked at Dudley in his new Kickerbockers, Uncle Vernon said gruffly that it was the proudest moment of his life. Aunt Petunia burst into tears, saying she couldn't believe that her ill, Ill delicans look he looked so handsome and grown up. Harry didn't trust himself to speak. He thought two of his ribs might already have been cracked from trying not to laugh. There was a horrible smell in the kitchen the next morning when Harry went in for breakfast. It seemed to be coming from the large metal tub in the sink. He went to have a look. The tub was full of what looked like dirty rags swimming in gray water. What's this? He asked Aunt Petunia. Her lips tightened as they always did when he dared to ask a question. Your new school uniforms, she said. Harry looked at the bowl. Oh, he said, I didn't realize it had to be so wet. Don't be stupid, snapped Aunt Petunia. I'm dying some of Dudley's old things gray for you. It'll look like everyone else's when I finish. Harry seriously doubt, doubted this, but he thought it best not to argue. He sat down at the table and tried not to think about how he was going to look on his first day at Stonewall High. Like he was wearing a bit of old elephant skin, probably. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came in, both with wrinkled noses because of the smell from Harry's new uniform. Uncle Vernon opened his newspaper as usual and Dudley banged his smelting stick, which he carried everywhere on the table. They heard the click of the letter box and flop, the flop of the letters on the doormat. Get the post, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon from behind his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the post, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. 
Harry dodged the smelting stick and went to get the post. Three things laid on the doormat. A postcard from Vernon's sister, Marge, who was holidaying on the Isles of Wright. A brown envelope that looked like a bill and a letter for Harry. Harry picked it up and stared at it, his heart twanging like a giant elastic band. No one ever in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library, so he never even got rude notes asking for book, books back. Yet here it was, a letter addressed so plainly there could be no mistake. Mr. H. Potter, the cupboard under the stairs for Privet Drive, Little Winging, Surrey. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellow parchment and the address was written in emerald ink, it, but there was no stamp. Turning the envelope over, his hand trembling, Harry saw a purple wax seal bearing a coat of arm, a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake, surrounded, surrounding a large letter H. Hurry up, boy, shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing, checking for letter bombs? He chuckled at his own joke. Harry went back to the kitchen, still staring at his letter. He handed Uncle Vernon the bills and the postcard. He sat, and he sat down and slowly began to open the yellow envelope. Uncle Vernon ripped open the bill, snorted in disgust, and flipped over the postcard. Marge is ill, he informed Aunt Petunia. Ate a funny whelk. Dad, said Dudley suddenly. Dad, Harry's got something. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written on the very same heavy parchment as the envelope, when it was jerked sharply out of his hand by Uncle Vernon. That's mine, said Harry, trying to snatch it back. Who'd be writing you, sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter open with one hand glancing at it. His face went from red to green faster than a set of traffic lights. When it didn't stop there, within a second, he was grayer grayish white of old porridge. P -p Petunia, he gasped. Dudley tried to grab the letter to read it, but Uncle Vernon held it high out of his reach. Aunt Petunia took it curiously and read the first line. For a moment, she looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. Vernon, oh my goodness, Vernon. They stared at each other, seemingly to have forgotten that Harry and Dudley were still in the room. Dudley wasn't used to being ignored. He gave his father a sharp tap on the head with the smelting stick. I want to read that letter, he said loudly. I want to read it, said Harry furiously, as it's mine. Get out, both of you, croaked Uncle Vernon, stuffing the letter back inside its envelope. Harry didn't move. I want my letter, he shouted. Let me see it, demanded Dudley. Out, roared Uncle Vernon. And he took both Harry and Dudley by the scruffs of their neck and threw them into the hallway, slamming the kitchen door behind them. Harry and Dudley promptly had a furious but silent fight over who would listen at the keyhole. Dudley won, so Harry hid his glasses dangling from one ear, lay flat on his stomach to listen at the crack between the door and the floor. Vernon, Aunt Petunia, was saying in a quivering voice, look at the address. How could they possibly know where he sleeps? You don't think they're watching the house? Watching, spying, might be following us, muttered Uncle Vernon wildly. But what should we do, Vernon? Should we write back, tell them we don't want? Harry could see Uncle Vernon's shiny black shoes pacing up and down the kitchen. No, he said finally. No, we'll ignore it. And they don't get an answer. Yes, that's best. We won't do anything. But I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out that dangerous nonsense? That evening when he got back from work, Uncle Vernon did something he had never done before. He visited Harry in his cupboard. Where's my letter, said Harry, the moment Uncle Vernon had squeezed through the door. Who's writing me? No one. It was addressed to you by mistake, said Uncle Vernon shortly. I have burned it. It was not a mistake, said Harry angrily. It had my cupboard on it. Silence, yelled Uncle Vernon, and a couple of spiders fell from the ceiling. 
He took a few deep breaths and then forced his face to, into a smile, which looked quite painful. Er, yes, Harry, about this cupboard. Your aunt and I have been thinking. You're really getting a bit big for it. We think it might be nice if you moved into Dudley's second bedroom. Why, said Harry. Don't ask questions, now, Uncle. his uncle. Take the stuff upstairs now. The Dursley's house had four bedrooms, one for Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia, one for visitors, usually Uncle Vernon's sister, Marge, and one where Dudley slept and one where Dudley kept off his toys and things that wouldn't fit into his bedroom. It only took Harry one trip up the stairs to move everything he owned from the cupboard to his room. He sat down on the bed and stared around him. Nearly everything here was broken. The month-old Senna camera was lying on top of the small working on top of a small working tank Dudley had once driven over the next door door's dog. In a corner was Dudley's first ever television set, which he put his foot through when his favorite program had been canceled. There was a large birdcage, which once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a rural air rifle, which was up on the shelf with the end all bent up because Dudley had sat on it. Other shelves were full of books. There were, were the only things in the room that looked as though they had never been touched. From downstairs came the sound of Dudley bawling at his mother. I don't want him in there. I need that room. Make him get out. Harry sighed and stretched out on the bed. Yesterday he would have given anything to be up here. Today he'd rather be back in the cupboard with that letter than to be up here without it. The next morning at breakfast, everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He screamed and whacked his father with the smelting stick been sick on purpose, kicked his mother and thrown his tortoise through the greenhouse roof, and he still didn't have his room back. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday and bitterly wishing he opened the letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the post arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go get it. They heard the, him banging things with his smelting stick all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, there's another one, Mr. H. Potter, the smallest bedroom, Ford Privet Drive. With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right behind him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Dudley to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of confused fighting, in which everyone got hit a lot by a, the smelting stick, Uncle Vernon straightened up, gasping for breath with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard, I mean to your bedroom, he wheezed at Harry. Dudley, go, just go. Harry walked round and round his new room. Someone knew he had moved out of his cupboard, and they seemed to know that he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant that they would try again, and this time he made sure that they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at 6 o'clock the next morning. Harry turned it off quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake, it, the, wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of Privet Drive and get the letters for number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall towards the front door. Arrgh! Harry leaped into the air. He trotted onto something big and squishy on the doormat, something alive. Lights clicked on upstairs. Into his horror, Harry realized the big squishy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the door in front of the door in a sleeping bag, clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he had been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about a half an hour and then told him to go make a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off to the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the post had arrived right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the letter box. She, he explained to, Uncle, to Aunt Petunia, 
through the mouth, mouthful of nails, if they can't deliver them, they'll just give up. I'm not sure that'll work, Vernon. Oh, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruitcake Aunt Petunia had just brought him. On Friday, no fewer than 12 letters arrived for Harry. As they couldn't go through the letter box, they had been pushed under the door, slotted through the sides, and even a few forced through the small window in the downstairs toilet. Uncle Vernon stayed home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nails and boarded up all the cracks around the front door and back door so no one could go out. He hummed tiptoe through the tulips as he worked and jumped at small noises. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. Twenty-four letters to Harry found their way into the house rolled up and hidden inside each of the two dozen eggs that their very confused milkman had handed Aunt Petunia through the living room window. While Uncle Vernon made a furious telephone call to the post office in the dairy trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food mixer. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly, Dudley asked Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table, looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays, he reminded them happily as he spread marmalade on his newspaper. No damn letters today. Something came whizzing down the... The kitchen chimneys as he spoke and caught him sharply on the back of the head. The next moment, 30 or 40 letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The, the Dursley stuck, but Harry leaped into the air trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized around Harry's waist and threw him under the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had run out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off the walls and the floor. That does it, said Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly, but pulling great tuffets out of his mustache at the same time. I want all of you back here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes. No arguments. He looked dangerous with his half-mustache missing that no one dared argue. Ten minutes later, they had wrenched their way through the boarded-up doors and were in the car, speeding towards the motorway. Dudley was sniffling in the back of the seat. His father had hit him around the head for holding them up while he tried to pack up his television, video, and computer in his sports bag. They drove and they drove. Even Aunt Petunia didn't dare ask where they were going. Every now and then, Uncle Vernon would take a sharp turn and drive in the opposite direction for a while. Shake them off! Shake them off! He would mutter whenever he did this. They didn't stop to eat or drink all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He'd never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry. He had missed five television programs he wanted to see, and he had never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped at last, outside a gloomy-looking hotel on the outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and a damp, musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the window sill, staring at the lights of passing cards and wondering. They ate still cornflakes and cold tinned tomatoes on toast for breakfast the next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. Excuse me, but is one of you Mr. H. Potter? I only got about a hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so they could read the green ink addressed. Mr. H. Potter, room 17, Railview Hotel, Cooksworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it be just better to go home, dear? said Aunt Petunia, suggested timidly. Hours later, 
but Uncle Vernon did not seem to hear her exactly what he was looking for. None of them knew. He drove them into the middle of the forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back in the car, and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a plowed field, halfway across a suspension bridge, and at the top of a multi-story car park. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia, duly late that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them up and all inside the car, and disappeared. It started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley sniveled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Humberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday. This reminded Harry of something. If it was Monday, and you could always count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of the television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's 11th birthday. Of course, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dursley had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you weren't 11 every day. Uncle Vernon was back, and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin package and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everyone out. It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked to be a large rock way out at sea. Perched on top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was certain, there was no television there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully, clapping his hands together. And this gentleman's kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless old man came ambling up to them, pointing with a rather wicked grad to an old rowing boat bobbing in the iron gray water below them. I've already got us some rations, said Uncle Vernon, so all aboard. It was freezing in the boat. Icy seas sprayed and rain crept down to their necks and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock where Uncle Vernon slipped and sliding, led the way to the broken down house. The inside was horrible and it smelled strongly of seaweed and the wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls. The fireplace was damp and empty. There were only two rooms. Vernon, Uncle Vernon's rations turned out to be a packet of crisps and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty crisp packets just smoked and shriveled up. Could do with some of those letters now, eh? He said cheerfully. He was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching them here on the storm to deliver post. Harry privately agreed, though the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, the promise of storm blew around them, spraying up from the high waves, splattered the walls of the hut, and the fierce winds rattled the filthy windows. Aunt Petunia found a few moldy blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door, and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could and curl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more ferociously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned, trying to get comfortable. His stomach rumbling with hunger, Dudley's snores were drowning, drowned by the low rolls of thunder that stared started near midnight. The light dial of Dudley's watch was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd be 11 in 10 minutes time. He laid and watched his birthday tick nearer, wondering if the Dursleys would remember at all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go, Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in, although he might be warmer if it did. Four minutes to go. Maybe the house in Privet Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. That was the sea, slapping hard on the, little, on the rocks like that. And two minutes to go. What was that funny crunching noise? 
Was the rock crumbling under the sea? One minute to go, and he'd be 11. 30 seconds, 20, 10, 9. Maybe he'd wake Dudley up just to annoy him. 2, th 3, 2, 1. Boom! The whole shack shivered, and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside, knocking to come in. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode of Reading with Grange. Uh, if you did and you want to be notified of the next uh, chapter, hit subscribe. And until next time, Faye and Miles' grandma misses you very, very much. And I will, uh, I can't wait to see you guys. Until next time, bye!